humans are truly remarkable in their ability to learn and develop skills. Through their tireless dedication, they've been able to achieve incredible feats that were once thought impossible. From hand weaving fibers that are only four microns thick, and knowing exactly how to straighten tailoring scissors purely by the feel, to being able to safely butcher one of the deadliest fish in the world. We traveled the earth to showcase some of the most talented artisans, masters, and craftspeople, and explore the stories behind their incredible skills. Our first stop is Echizen, Japan. This is Terukazu. He has spent 37 years crafting chef's knives at his family's factory in Echizen. Each knife goes through a hundred stages of production. It's a process that requires 10 years of practice and an immense amount of skill. Without the correct technique, the knives cannot be accepted at the high standard set by Takamura Homono. あの、一番大事なことは、え、大まかに言って3つあります。え、まずいい材料。次に、え、いい焼き入れとか熱処理ですね、炭蔵、熱処理。で、最後にいい研ぎ。この3つがないとどれがどれ1つかけていても絶対
90 different types of scissor. You know, when you've got the, you just, just, you've just got that like magic touch of how to hold them, how to stroke them, how to edge them. And this, to instill on young lads, is hard. Because it's not something you can write down and learn read. They've got to actually do it. Traditionally, you would undertake a five-year apprenticeship before you could even sit at the putter's table. And most surprisingly, the most important tool for this isn't anything small and delicate, but a hammer. And I'm only going to get a tap. The hammer is crucial to aligning the blades correctly. So, oh, that's better. The two scissor parts are screwed into place and then a perfect curve is hammered into each blade. This part of the process is the hardest to get right and the hardest skill to pass on. If he hits that with the wrong tension or the, uh, at the wrong angle or in the wrong spot, he will ruin those scissors. So I've put a scissor blade down and I've, I've taken a swing at it and I have just snapped the blade in half. Once the two halves are married together, a final blade will be put on the scissor. Perfecting the art of putting together can take years. When I pick a pair of scissors up, it tells me a story. I cannot really shut it, it's tight, it's like... You can virtually just shove it away to your finger and it does the job. That's what you're after. Week after week, year after year if need be. And that's it. Next, we're in Hanoi, Vietnam. Fan Thi Thuan's family have been making silk for generations, growing and harvesting the threads from silkworms themselves to create luxury garments. But making lotus silk is different. Silk usually comes from silkworms. They're kept on wide trays and need to be fed almost 24 hours a day with mulberry leaves. The caterpillars delicately spin threads to create their cocoons and it can take hundreds of silkworms to make a kilo of silk. But while the insects require careful looking after, they do most of the hard work themselves. The key difference between the bright yellow silk and the paler lotus version is that every single strand of lotus silk must be extracted by hand. Với chúng tôi thì tất cả đất nước Việt Nam, nhân dân Việt Nam là ai cũng rất là quý cái bông hoa sen. Tất cả nước chúng tôi là rất là nhiều người trồng sen. Nhưng mà Bao giờ cũng chỉ có thu hoa sen, thu hạt sen thôi, còn cuống sen là vứt ra nó rất là bẩn. Khi mà người ta gợi ý cho tôi làm tơ sen thì tôi thấy có nợi cho nhân dân, cho nông dân thì tôi tôi nghĩ là tôi có khả năng làm được thì tôi sẽ quyết tâm tôi làm. Once the stem is selected and picked by hand, the silk inside can be extracted. Each stem contains a minuscule amount of thin sticky fibers which must be delicately rolled together and dried. The threads need to be processed within 24 hours while they're still wet, otherwise they will break. And so harvesting has to be done each day. And the lotus plants are only available to harvest between April and October. Once you've gone through the hard work of extracting these fibers, they're incredibly delicate too. Bước đầu là tôi chưa nghĩ đến làm tơ sen thì tôi nghĩ là tơ sen thì nó mỏng manh mà làm thì nó rất nhiều công. Sợi tơ tằm thì nó dai hơn cho nên là có thể dệt được bằng máy còn sợi tơ sen thì nó không có độ dai như sợi sợi tơ tằm cho nên là phải dệt bằng tay. Cái thời gian của cái việc lấy sợi là lâu nhất. Còn khi mà đã lấy được sợi rồi cho vào máy dệt rồi thì nó cũng nhanh hơn nhiều bởi vì tất cả bao nhiêu bao nhiêu công đoạn mới được lấy được sợi thì một người lao động làm một ngày được 200 đến 250 cuống sen. Còn cái khăn rộng 36cm, dài 1m75 thì hết 9.200 cuống sen thì một người phải làm một cái khăn đấy là phải mất 2 tháng mới được một cái khăn. Once dried, the threads are carefully weighed down and hand spooled, then put into the loom. These fibers are fragile by themselves, but once woven, can be as durable as traditional silk. The final product is unlike any other fibre. It's soft like silk, breathable like linen, and slightly elastic. Tôi dậy rất là nhiều, nhưng mà dậy những người lớn tuổi cũng nhiều. 
những người lớn tuổi họ sẽ không không có cái sự sáng tạo không có đam mê mà không có cái làm thì nhanh bằng những thế hệ trẻ cho nên là hai năm năm 19 20 này là tôi đã dùng các em học sinh trong những dịp nghỉ hè là tôi dạy các em ấy. mỗi năm là dạy 100 em rồi. thì là nhìn thấy cái thế hệ tương lai đấy nó mới phát triển được tơ sen cho chúng tôi nhưng mà tôi chỉ mong là nhân dân Việt Nam và những thế hệ mai sau nó sẽ giỏi hơn chúng tôi để nó sẽ có những cái cách làm khác đi thì nó sẽ làm được nhiều hơn nhanh hơn Next we're in Goodwood, England. Rolls-Royce pays extreme attention to detail on every car they produce. With Rolls-Royce, prices are not given out to anyone as the cars are fully bespoke from top to bottom. The level of quality can be seen and felt throughout every model. And that's thanks to their highly skilled workers. Remarkably, the detailed paintwork on Rolls-Royce cars is done by hand by just one person. My name is Mark Court and I am the coach liner for Rolls Royce Motorcars. A coach liner means that I am able to put this pinstripe onto the side of the car. The uniqueness is the fact that I do it completely freehand and I'm the only one within Rolls Royce that can do this. That's like worldwide within the Rolls Royce BMW group. Even the tools used are meticulously researched and crafted in order to have the finest finishes on each car model. So the brushes I use is made of squirrel hair. We found that most brushes nowadays are man-made, which tends to leave brush marks within these lines. This is a natural hair. This natural hair tends to leave no marks at all. So we work to one standard, which is the highest standard. So we use one that leaves no brush marks at all. And if customers without a coach line decide to add one to their car, Mark is on hand to travel worldwide with his paintbrush. As normal, with Rolls-Royce, Rolls-Royce never comes back to us, we go to it. So, if it's in Dubai, so be it, that's where I have to go. Next, we go to Tokyo, Japan. The tetrodotoxin found in Fugu is more toxic than cyanide, and each year around 20 people suffer poisoning from badly prepared fish. Despite that, this deadly puffer fish is a delicacy served across Japan. There are over 120 species of pufferfish, 22 different kinds are approved by the government for use in restaurants. But one is more prized and more poisonous than the others, torofugu or tiger fugu. Yamadaya has been serving pufferfish for over 100 years and it serves this specific kind. It takes a lot of skill and training to prepare this fish safely and know which parts are poisonous. Here is one of Yamadaya's chefs who's been through an intense amount of training to be able to cook and serve such a potentially dangerous fish. The poisonous parts can vary by species, and hybrid species are appearing now that are even harder to tell apart. One of the hardest things to distinguish can be the female fugu's ovaries, which are extremely toxic, and the male's testicles, which are a delicacy. The Japanese government tightly control who can prepare fugu, and chefs need to take an extensive exam before they're legally allowed to serve the fish. This rigorous regulation means that while the fish can be lethal, Far more people die from eating oysters than fugu each year. ま、フグの試験はまずフグの種類とあとはこのフグの種類でも食べられるところが違うとか食べれないフグとかそういうのを勉強してまフグの砂漠ってなると時間があって東京の場合だと20分以内で刺身まで。で、まあ、あと、それと別で夫婦の種類を当てるっていう。それをやって、まあ、合格できれば試験勉強がもらえる。Our next stop is Worthing, England. With a single tap 
Mike Dadson can turn a faulty oboe back into the instrument it once was, in perfect condition. And then hopefully at the end, we should uh, achieve a bottle tight joint. It takes five years to make a high-end oboe from start to finish. Oboes are one of the most complicated instruments to make, as the highest quality ones are made with African blackwood, which is a very difficult material to work with. The process of hollowing out the wood and sculpting the exterior is carried out carefully over a number of years and with remarkable precision. Oboes that are considered high quality cannot have a single imperfection. Fixing bent keys is a test of patience. Sometimes, straightening out one key can bend another piece elsewhere. Mike draws upon decades of practiced dexterity to correct even the tiniest imperfections. I found the point where I perceived the bend to be so hopefully I'll just be able to... One back. Mike often takes over three days to fine tune an oboe, but all this patient work pays off. We like to say you're only as good as your last oboe, basically. How good was your last oboe? Very good. <laughs> Next, we arrive in Kawajiri, Japan. Creating a custom-made calligraphy brush takes an intense amount of attention to detail. If a single hair is out of place, it must be removed. 70-year-old third-generation brushmaker Yoshiyuki Hata turns countless strands of raw hair into a perfect brush tip for master calligraphers, and he's been making these brushes since he was a teenager. His family's workshop in Kawajiri focuses on what they call no-compromise craftsmanship. Each brush tip is handmade by a single artisan, but making these brushes isn't easy. For a master calligrapher like Deizo Kaneko, small differences in a brush's hardness or ink retention can drastically affect the lines that it can produce. The dozens of steps involved in brush making start with selecting the hair. Yoshiyuki uses a special type of hair to make his brushes that being hair from the chest of a specific breed of goats that live in the Yangtze River Delta. He uses the hair from this specific breed because it's soft yet durable and retains ink extremely well. Selecting high-quality hair is done entirely by eye, and it's one of the hardest skills for a new brushmaker to learn. But this long process is just beginning. Once the hairs are chosen, they're boiled and combed to remove any fluff. This process separates straight, long hairs, which are ideal for brush making. One of the most time-consuming steps is aligning all of these hairs. This delicate work is key to making a uniform brush, but it's largely based on experience and instinct. <laughs> Throughout the process, brush makers patiently remove any imperfect or damaged hairs. そうですね。あの、無駄毛あんだけ取ったらもう毛がなくなるんじゃないか言われるんですが、それも
始めたのがやはりあの工房が遊び場だったんでちっちゃい頃からそれはね200パターンぐらいは頭の中にあるんですよね設計図が。まあやっぱし目と手と勘ですよね。At this stage, Yoshiyuki's vision for a brush starts to take shape. After trimming, he wets the hair and combines different bundles to create a brush that is dense and durable. Then he dips the hair in fenori, an adhesive liquid made from seaweed, to hold the hairs together. Ato, Shodo Kan Sensei, Jakara, de Takega, Ichi Miri, Nimiri, Rekoma, Namiri, Yuare, Kasoreni, Kote, Demo, Teo Nuitara, Sono Fudewa, Bokwa, Damija Mosim, Umumumasane, Tamashiga, Haito Rankara. The finished brush tip is almost unrecognizable from the raw hair. But the precise work isn't over yet. Once the hair dries, Yoshiyuki ties up the ends and burns each one with a hot iron, binding the hairs together. Any mistake here could completely ruin a month of work. Finally, it's time to assemble the brush. Like the brush tip, each handle is custom made. <laughs> Kozo, Yoshiyuki's son, will be the workshop's fourth generation brush maker. やはり父も職人であまり言葉を通して伝えるっていうことはしないしできない人間なので自分が見て学ぶそれから作っていったものの結果がいいものになれば父はうなるよしそれ悪ければもうただひたすら違う Next we go to London, England Shaving off a millimeter too much of leather could ruin the fit of this bespoke shoe To make a finished pair artisans must carve hammer and stitch each detail to the exact specifications of a customer's foot twice Simon Bolzoni is the last maker and owner of Canons, a store in London that has been selling bespoke shoes all made by hand, using traditional techniques passed down over centuries. You could bring a craftsperson in here that made our shoes 100 years ago and they'd be able to start work probably straight away. The fit is tailored completely to each person, whereas a ready-made shoe is essentially a generic shape it will either fit your right foot or your left foot, but it won't perfectly fit both. The key difference is this, the last. It's a wooden mould carved to the exact measurements and features of the customer's foot. It's the foundation of the whole shoe. It determines whether the shoe is going to be comfortable. It's also the style. To make a last, shoemakers start by measuring the client's feet in six to eight key locations. Each foot is measured separately, and a different last will be created for each shoe. He starts by cutting away large amounts of wood, then makes small adjustments with hand tools. Even the smallest little half a millimetre sometimes can just make all the difference. It can just throw the whole thing off. The easiest thing for me to do would be to just make a beautiful last. The challenge is to make it beautiful and to actually make it fit. Last making is Simon's specialty. He inherited this workbench from the shoemaker who trained him. This has been in the business for forever. I believe it was with the business before he came into it, which was in the 1950s. Making a last can take days. It's a constant process of carving wood and checking the measurements. Leather is another key component to the bespoke shoes created here at Cannons. Before cutting, one of the artisans, Reese, examines the leather for any defects. As I go through the skin, I pull up every section of the skin and examine it, and what I'm looking for is a blemish-free section. So it can't have any tick marks, tick bites, you know, any stretch marks, because that will show up when the shoe is lasted and spoil the look of the shoe. At this level, anything like that is unacceptable. We have to have a perfect skin. Often we only cut one pair per skin. This leather will become the upper, 
the top part of the shoe. Artisans pull it tightly over the last and carefully work it into shape to ensure there's no excess material or wrinkles. This step alone can take two days and requires a very steady hand. It's a constant process of stretching, hammering and scraping. Yazoo has been a shoemaker for over 25 years. He works quickly, but each motion is intentional, bringing the shoe closer to its final shape. Achieving a clean fit is essential for premium bespoke shoes. But the upper isn't the only part of the shoe that needs a clean fit. The bottom of the shoe has two parts, the outer sole, which touches the ground, and the inner sole, which sits under your foot. To make the inner sole, artisans cut out leather and meticulously tack it around the last. As with the upper part of the shoe, artisans shape this material to perfectly match the customer's foot. So this customer's got a really high arch in here, so we're going to do an insole up for support. And he's also got this pocket here where his joint sits um, that's been added. So basically this is going to be molded completely to the last. And this is one of the fundamental things that separates, you know, ready to wear or factory made shoes from bespoke shoes. For each step, shoemakers work with the shoe on their lap, paying their full attention to every detail. It basically just gives you control. You're able to like switch back and forth. You can change the position of this quite freely. You can check how it's sitting, you know, check the movement of the leather. I think if you've got it in a held position, you just don't have that flexibility. To fuse all of these pieces together, shoemakers use a sewing technique called welting. They sew a strip of leather around the shoe to attach the sole to the upper. Some shoe manufacturers use glue to combine all of the parts, but Simon says a stitched welt like this makes the shoe easier to repair. It's ideal actually because the outsole can be stripped off. You can just take another piece of leather and stitch back through the welt again. So it's almost infinitely repairable. As long as the upper is kept in reasonable condition, the shoe really can last a lifetime. A ready-made shoe would easily be made in a day, There's made in a factory environment. You could quite easily notice the difference. When you put your feet into the shoe, you'll lock into a bespoke shoe. It's because the insole has been blocked to the shape of the bottom of your foot. For Simon, crafting the perfect fit for a client makes all the effort worth it. I like the journey that it takes that you go on a journey with each of these individual people, which might last for many, many years. It could last for, you know, your whole career when you're doing it. Next, we go to Nagano, Japan. Bonsai is an art form that requires years of training and centuries of dedication. Chiako Yamamoto is a fourth generation bonsai master based in central Japan and has been creating bonsai for the last 51 years. One of the hardest skills to master when growing these plants is patience, a skill Chiako has in abundance. で、これがこうなってきます。で、これがそうですね。やっぱり絵だとかそういうのはもう完成したらそこからは何も変わっていかない。でも盆栽は変わっていくんですよね。それは自分の愛情とか管理で変わっていく。そうやっていつも安定してない、不安定感があるから安定してないものに自分の愛
そうやっていつもいつも変わるその5年後になんでこんな作り方しちゃったのかなっつってそれは植物生きてるから太陽に向いて好き勝手にこう動いちゃうわけよそうすると自分の発想と違う動きしちゃうそれともう一回自分の見方をこうやってあこれよろしくないっていつもいつもそうやって変化してくるその結果がすぐ出ないから長生きしないと結果が見えてこない The extraordinary length of this process means that there just aren't that many trees around. Certain types of trees are also harder to grow or require certain techniques and may fetch a higher price. But more than anything, these trees are works of art, valued for their beauty and the vision of the artist. Our next stop is Lowestoft, England. Making a Series 7 Kalinsky Sable watercolour brush isn't easy. The largest size brush can take almost a week and a half to make. The intricate work and dexterity required means these brushes are almost exclusively made by women. It takes three years to train, and there are only nine brush makers in the world that can make the top of the range Series 7 brushes. Sandra Harris has been working and honing her brush making skills for over two decades. I joined here when I was 16. I worked 18 years. And then I had 12 years off and I've been back 11, so that's 28 years I've been working for the company. Each brush head is made from Kalinsky Sable, a Siberian weasel whose hair is said to cost three times the price of gold by weight. Once the hairs are cleaned and graded, it's time to start making the brush. The wool is removed with a comb and the hairs are packaged up and carefully boiled and ironed. The brushes have to be made with hair at its natural length. And the skilled brush makers can effortlessly separate between 28 and 32 millimeter length hairs just with their hands. This skill takes years of training and practice. The nine brush makers each have 27 years of experience on average. Hairs that are blunt or twisted have to be discarded. And most importantly, as each natural hair comes to a point, Every hair must be the correct way up. The removed upside down hairs can be flipped and reused. Hairs facing different directions can be separated using a turning board and some skill. Every single hair is checked over by hand. The smallest brush size hairs are just seven millimeters long, shorter than an average eyelash. We can't afford to let standards drop in any way, shape or form. What I would say from that is what this factory has is hand skills. It has individual skills. It has skills that when I have new people come in here, they don't sometimes believe that this kind of work still happens. We show them what people do, they will turn around and say, I'll never be able to do that. But they will be able to do that if they understand that quality comes first. When the hairs are all sorted, they're ready to go into the cannon. The bundle is tied together and gently twisted through. Individual hairs are added or taken away until it's an exact fit. They need to have that fine point to work with, that basically it has that colour carrying capacity, that the brush won't split or do anything that it shouldn't do, basically. Through the hair that we use, through the skills of our makers and how they make them, we've done everything we possibly can to make sure that we have produced the best product we possibly can. Then it's time to attach the handles. The factory uses birchwood handles, imported from Italy. The brush is glued into place, and then the brush heads are crimped onto the handles. This crimping process bends the metal to shape and keeps the handle tightly attached to the brush. Once the paintbrush is assembled, it needs to be branded and tested. The size and logo of each brush is stamped in gold on the handle. Wet point testing assures that everything works exactly as expected and there aren't any loose or crooked hairs. Each brush is then gummed, a process that gives it the final shape and allows it to bounce back. The shape of the natural hairs gives the brush a wide belly and a fine point. So the key to our brush making is the people. 
and that is the skill. We retain knowledge from generation to generation. So we have makers now that are working under an apprenticeship of a 49 year served brush maker who himself had an apprenticeship under another 49 year serving brush maker who was brought into the business under his father who made brushes directly for Queen Victoria. And it's very key that we retain that knowledge throughout the business, generation to generation, and we are now bringing in the next generation to make sure that we uphold the very high quality standards that we base ourselves on. Our next stop is Iran. Handwoven with the finest materials, including wool and silk, a single Persian rug can often take years and sometimes decades to create. We followed some of the highly skilled rug weavers to get a deeper understanding of the process that goes into making these incredible rugs. I said that every house can be able to get the size of the house داره همون سایز داشته باشه مثلا طرف خانم یه ممکنه خونه کوچیکی داشته باشه دار کوچکتری داره و فرقی که دار فرشای فارس میکنه مخصوصا حالا تو گبه و اینو سخت میکنه بافتش رو برای بافنده خیلی سختتر میشه اینه که دار فرشای فارس زمینیه فرشای فارس به صورت افقیه یعنی بافنده خیلی باید بیشتر زحمت بکشه از کمرش خیلی اذیت میشه و باید به این صورت the process of weaving a Persian rug differs slightly with each variety, but generally speaking, a bed of foundation material called warp is installed into a frame called the loom. Starting at the bottom, weavers then feed wool in between the warp, tying knots called weft on each one. A highly detailed silk rug can have over a thousand knots per square inch. و به طب هر چی که فرش بزرگتر میشه خب زمانش بیشتر میشه و یه وقتای یه گبه ها یا یه فرش هایی که مثلا یه گبه هایی که مثلا خیلی بزرگترن دیگه یه نفر نمیتونه به بافه احتیاج به چهار نفر، سه نفر کنار هم با هم باید اینو بیارنش به قول معروف بالا خب این ضربه در مثلا یه گبه دوازده متری رو اگه یه نفر بخواد به بافه شاد دو سال طول بکشه ولی چون چهار نفر با هم شروع میکنن به بافت تقسیم به چهار میشه مثلا میتونه تو شیش ماه هفت ماه این بافته بشه یه متر گبه رو تقریبا بین یک ماه تا دو ماه یه نفر میتونه یک متر گبه به بافت Some Persian rugs are made following preset patterns but a lot of the designs are down to the amazing creativity and improvisation of the weavers who like to add their own traditional motifs such as goats, trees and dolls با فرمول نداره اینو یه باید با گوشت و پوست و استخونتون حس کنید کلکیت زدن رو بافتن فرش رو گره ها رو درست چیز کردن جالب این که کسی که مثلا یه فرش قشقایی خوب میبافه این نمیتونه بره یه فرش تبریز خوب ببافه یا اون کسی که یه فرش تبریز عالی میبافه نمیتونه بره یه فرش شاد اسفهان خوب ببافه و جذابیت و با است اینو بدونیم که جالبه که هر منطقه ای یه فرش رو میتونه خوب بوافه. Next, we head to the Nara Prefecture in Japan. This is ink. Toshitsugu Akabe has been tirelessly kneading it until it's as soft as a rice cake. It's imperative for him to be as thorough as possible to create the high quality ink only a master can produce. The process of creating this ink takes a long time. Any artisan needs to have years of experience to reach these high levels of craftsmanship. The most intensive and lengthy parts of the process are the kneading and drying stages, where all the soot, glue and fragrance are combined together. The dough is kneaded every morning, by hand and foot. Toshitsugu takes care to knead it thoroughly, so the soot and glue are evenly distributed. That way, the solid stick can eventually dissolve into homogeneous liquid ink. Once he's properly kneaded the dough, Toshitsugu cuts it into balls and weighs them for consistency.
Then he places the balls into moulds and uses a machine to press them into shape. Improperly kneaded dough results in ink sticks that don't produce a rich colour. Kobayen makes about 6,000 of its smallest, highest quality ink sticks a month. It employs a handful of artisans for this, and the ones tasked with kneading require the most experience. It takes five years to train as a sumi ink craftsperson, but ten years before they're allowed to make high quality ink. Kobayen produces almost 40,000 of its smallest sumi ink sticks between October and April. When the cooler weather of winter ensures the glue can harden during shaping. Drying the ink sticks too quickly will cause them to crack, making them unsellable. So artisans rely on a traditional technique, using oak ash to slowly absorb moisture from the sticks over a long period of time. They start by placing the sticks over moist ashes. Each day they swap yesterday's ashes with drier ones. They repeat this process for up to 40 days until the ink sticks are about 70% dry. After, they hang the sticks with straw and air dry them in-house for up to six months. Properly drying and maturing an ink stick takes at least four years, making this entire process require incredible amounts of patience. Things have to be done this way for the sticks to be able to perform at their best. Our next stop is Lombok, Indonesia. This is the most important moment in the process of creating a South Sea Pearl. The moment when Harry inserts the nucleus into an oyster, around which a pearl will form. If he's not precise, the resulting pearl may come out misshapen. South Sea refers to the southern portion of the Pacific Ocean. In these waters, just off the coast of Lombok, Indonesia, pearl farms like Afdol Pearl are growing cultured pearls. These are pearls that require an incredibly skilled human to put something inside an oyster, instead of harvesting naturally occurring pearls. While some freshwater oysters can churn out dozens of smaller pearls within three months, it takes about five years to cultivate a single South Sea pearl. And the oyster it comes from, the Pink Tarda Maxima, can only make one at a time. Only a fourth of these oysters survive cultivation. That's why the pearl farmers have to go to great lengths to keep the oysters alive. It starts in this highly controlled laboratory, where lab technicians must create the perfect conditions for oyster larvae to grow into healthy, pearl-producing adults. They have to maintain a room temperature of exactly 20 degrees Celsius and feed the larvae the phytoplankton they need to grow. To do this, they combine salt water from the South Sea with sodium hydroxide and store it for five days until there's enough plankton. Lab techs feed the plankton to nests of baby oysters and monitor their growth for about 45 days. That's about the time they reach at least one millimeter in diameter and are old enough to be transferred to sea. In the South Sea, the oysters get the warm waters and food they need to mature but this is also where most of them will die without producing a single pearl. Itu yang akan hidup nanti cuma 25.000 dari 10.000 itu. Eh, 2.500 maksudnya. Karena 75% itu dia pasti meninggal. That's why pearl farmers have to check on the oysters monthly to ensure they're still growing, eating and healthy. They pull the nets of oysters up from the sea and clean the shells. This helps prevent predators from feeding off the oysters and eventually killing them. As you can see, nurturing these oysters takes a lot of time and patience, as well as a meticulous attention to detail. 
If this isn't done, the likelihood of these oysters dying starts to increase dramatically. Ya agar ini kadang kalau kerangnya kotor kan tertutup semua. Jadi susah untuk makan. Di sini banyak lumut, banyak kotoran, banyak bakteri juga. Ada ulat di sini. Kadang-kadang itu yang bisa bikin mutiara jelek. Jadi tujuannya juga untuk kita bangunkan. Kadang-kadang kerang tak mau bangun. After up to two years of nursing, when the oysters are large enough, implantation can begin. For cultured pearls, implantation is the most important step. When the nucleus is implanted, an oyster sees it as an irritant and reacts by building protective layers of nacre around it. This becomes a pearl. Henry is demonstrating where the nucleus is implanted into an opened oyster. Nah, terus yang ini, ini inti namanya. Jadi sebelum masukkan ini terbuat dari kulit kerangnya. He tears the oyster's gonads and injects the nucleus in the middle. He then adds saibo under the nucleus. Saibo is a mantle tissue cut from another oyster that surrounds the implanted nucleus. It's essential to the pearl quality, and without it, the oyster won't produce any pearls at all. Harry is the only person Aftol trusts with this step. After the nucleus is implanted, special attention is paid to how the nacre grows around it. To avoid a misshapen pearl, they're working towards a large, almost perfectly round pearl. Workers invert the oysters and put them in their protective nets to bring back to sea. The South Sea pearl's unique soft satin luster and thick nacre are the result of the warm waters it grows in. And a thick nacre means a large pearl. Harry says they must flip them regularly, so the nacre grows evenly. Jadi itu tidak boleh terlewatkan dia selama 40 hari itu ada schedulenya kita bikin schedule untuk tiga hari satu minggu setelah suntik kita biarkan setelah lubang yang kita robek itu nutup baru kita bolak balik. After 40 days, workers remove the oysters from the sea and clean them weekly. Harry checks the implanted oysters monthly to see how the pearl is developing. This is done for up to two years before the first pearl can be harvested. Untuk tiga tahun pertama itu minimal size-nya dari 0,9 atau 0,8 gram atau bisa dikatakan 7 sampai 11 mm itu tahap yang pertama tiga tahun pertama itu bijinya itu 1,3 gram lah minimal 0,8 lah ya. Harry implants the same oyster two more times. Each time, the pearl aftol it harvests is bigger. By the third harvest, the pearl can reach over 20 millimeters in diameter and over eight grams in weight. But as much as pearl farmers like Mahmood invest in the intense care needed to raise the oysters, the outcome is never guaranteed. Mahmood says only 20% of the oysters that survive make the most valuable kind of pearl. Almost perfectly round, lustrous and large. Mahmood grades the pearls based on size, luster, shape and colour. The larger, rounder, shinier, minimally blemished pearls get the highest grade. That can be triple or quadruple A, depending on the producer. Mahmood then sells them to jewellers, like Rihanna Melia, who fashions the pearls into necklaces, earrings and rings. Our next stop is Uban Rachitani, Thailand. Hand-beaten from sheet materials, the labor-intensive shaping and delicate paintwork result in beautiful percussive instruments. This is Thailand's Gong Highway, a 21-mile stretch of road that is home to more than 50 family-owned gong companies. In the heart of the highway is Bunrak Sichana's workshop. As a third-generation gong maker, Bunrak has been studying and practicing gong making for almost 50 years. ชอบทําของติดตามการทําของพ่อและปู่ย่าตาใหญ่มาตั้งแต่เล็กๆตั้งแต่ 6 
งานอาชีพงานฝีมือก็หรือว่างานแฮนด์เมดนะครับเป็นงานที่ยากก็ว่าได้จะว่าง่ายก็ได้สำหรับคนที่เป็นนะครับ The process begins by cutting the sheet material into a circle. No materials go to waste here. Even the offcuts are used to make the largest shape possible. This flat dish is then ready to be hammered into shape. The gongs made here in Thailand are of the bossed variety, where a center knob is surrounded by smaller nipples. This design is stenciled on the back of the gong with a homemade compass, and bangers begin to hammer out the shape. The bangers use templates engraved into tree stumps that allow the knob and nipples to be hammered out fully and evenly. After this physically intense step comes an even harder part: the tuning. Tuners observe and train for years to master their skill. They then strike the gong in different places. And listen for acoustic imperfections. <laughs> Using a mallet to make slight alterations, they continue this process, hoping to reduce dissonance in the sound frequencies emitted from the gong. ทัศน์ศาสตร์เนี่ยเราจะรู้ว่าเสียงคองจะทำยังไงให้มันดังครับแล้วจุดไหนที่มันไพเราะจุดไหนที่เสียงกังวานเราต้องรู้ครับต้องรู้ว่าจะจะตกแต่งตรงไหนดีบางเจ้าเขาชอบเสียงสูงก็ตามเหมือนกับคอร์ดเสียงแต่ได้เสียง Once satisfied with the sound, the gong is coated in enamel, ready to be hand painted by extremely talented artists. The quality and traditional craftsmanship at Bunrak's workshop is clear to see, and the historical importance of the gong is felt throughout Southeast Asia. คือเสียงกองวานนะครับกองวานแล้วก็เสียงยาวแล้วก็ตีไปเนี่ยรู้สึกกองวานในหัวใจซึ้งในเสียงเพราะมันเสียงเป็นเสียงบอกบุญนะครับเสียงบอกบุญคือเสียงคล้องในเป็นเสียงบอกบุญเป็นสัญญาณ Next we're in Kyoto Japan Making a Japanese longbow is a very challenging task Kanjuro Shibata's family has been making bows for over 450 years. Bamboo is a core material to creating the longbows, and Kanjuro tries to obtain most of his bamboo locally around Kyoto. Even these initial steps take time and patience, as before the bamboo is used, it needs to be dried for three years. Kanjuro shaves the dried bamboo down to a thickness of four to five millimeters. This is one of the most physically demanding parts of the process, because bamboo is dense and fibrous. มาดักเกอ้อทุกไอ้มาสข้าวโคชิงิกุยแต่ก็ยุ่มีโอ้ทุกรุ่นนิ่งเกินที่ว่านี่ว่าที่จริงนี่ยุ่มีอาณาคัสเซ่ดีอาริมัสเกดโม A Japanese bow consists of three main layers: two pieces of bamboo and an inner core called nakuichi. The nakuichi is made out of laminated bamboo and wax tree wood, and it's much harder than the bamboo on the outside. เดี๋ยวสรุปจุลันเซนี่ทุบได้หรือได้ก็よくまひあのよく曲がることは曲がるんですけども、元へ戻ら戻る力がすごく弱いんです。で柔軟性にかける材料と柔軟性に飛んだ材料を合わせてそれぞれの長所を生かし生かすためにこういうに竹とその木を合わせて作るのが日本の意味なんです。Kanjuro glues filled bamboo on either side of the nakuichi to form the bow. For some bows, he uses a natural glue called nibe, which is harder to work with. Making the final product more expensive than the bows that use synthetic glue, but the hardest part is bending this straight bamboo into the shape of a bow. Kanjuro winds rope around the bamboo and inserts over a hundred wedges, while bending curves into the bow. Because of the bow's length, this process is extremely tedious, but it must be done quickly before the glue dries. Thanks to decades of patience, it takes Kanjuro around 10 to 15 minutes. ついつことによって、この三三つあの竹二枚と中打ちという部材三つがぐっとこう締まって圧着できます
その時点で大体弓の良し悪しは決まってしまいます。Despite the importance of this step, Kanjiro shapes his bows entirely by eye. でそれは別にあの肩を当ててその全部ここの,あの曲,がりか曲がる R はこれだけっていうのは決まってなくて全部自分とやっぱりあの頭の中で描いたものをこうこうしようこうしようっていう描いたものを全部手に伝えてやっていきますんでその今なお前であのくさびを打っていたかでカビを打って作る形っていうのは弓の,その自分が作りたい弓の形の反対側の曲線を描かされるわけですその弓の強さと反発力をめる高めるような仕事。After the glue dries, Kanjiro removes the wedges and bends the bow into its final shape. まあ見た目はキャチャに見えるんですけども使ってみると手ごわくて強いだけじゃなくてなんていうかな、キレがいいとか反発力が強いとか。弓,、まあ、あの,弓の性能というのはやっぱりあの軽くてその割に強くてキレがある使ってて気持ちがいい。Kanjiro wants his bows to be accessible to more people. As long as it doesn't affect the final quality, he tries to make the process as efficient as he can. 僕職人って呼ばれるのは好きじゃないんです。あのなんていうか技術者でありたいと思う。クラフトマンチップってありますよね。です僕私そういう精神量はあんまり好きじゃないんです。で自分が弓を買う時の,あの求めて買う時の基準はやはり引き味しなやかさとかそういう,こう体にこうマッチしてくるでそういう感じを引いてみて選んでます。で非常に個性が作り手の個性を反映するもんなんで。自分というあの作り手を信頼して。Our next stop is New Hampshire, USA. This is a Damascus knife. Master bladesmith Zach Jonas is twisting a fusion of steels to make one of the trademark swirl patterns in a Damascus knife. But these unique swirls are more than just decorative. Successfully welding dozens or even thousands of steel layers creates some of the strongest and sharpest knives around, and making these knives is extremely difficult. To make Damascus steel, Zach starts by layering two different kinds of high carbon steel. Managing the layers means more work for the smith. And while high end mono steel knives may perform similarly, Damascus knives are coveted for their striking appearance and the craftsmanship required to achieve it. After tacking the layers together, Zach puts the stack in the forge and heats it to about 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. This step requires many years of experience, training the eye to judge when the steel is ready, because it's at risk of breaking off the handle where the layers are not yet forge welded together. Zach needs to consider the kind of pattern he wants to make before he can begin forging. This step requires many years of experience, training the eye to judge when the steel is ready, because it's at risk of breaking off from the handle while the layers are not yet forge welded together. A bold pattern means fewer layers, and a more intricate pattern can require several thousand. And working with so many layers to achieve his intended design means lots of things can go wrong. Out of thousands of hammer strikes, A single blow in the wrong place can ruin the pattern. Even when the pattern is done to perfection, Zach has to forge the steel into a knife without distorting the design. And if he forges the steel when it's too cold, it can crack and he has to start over, which for Damascus steel can mean losing weeks of work. This is not a simple task, only masters of the craft are able to pull this technique off consistently. Once he forge welds the steel into a long bar, Zach can begin folding over the layers. So you can see I'm twisting the steel with this wrench. It's got to be real hot. If it gets too cool, the layers will want to shear, come apart, and then the piece is trash. I'm keeping track of the rate that I'm twisting at and counting as I go. This technique is specific to twist Damascus, and it creates star like patterns on the steel. Too much twisting, and the steel will want to shear, but 
The tighter the twist, the more dramatic the pattern. And that'll do it. When Zach is making a standard Damascus wave pattern, he continues to work on elongating and thinning the bar using a power hammer. Once Zach forges the tip of the blade, he cross-checks it with his template to ensure the knife looks exactly as it should. Now it needs to undergo a metallurgical change, which is called heat treatment, and this part is hardening. And without doing this, the thing might be shaped like a knife, but it won't behave like a knife. It won't take an edge, it won't hold an edge. So the heat treatment is really, really a critical process, uh, and it determines the metallurgy and therefore the performance of the finished knife. But it's the quenching that makes or breaks the knife. Sometimes a blade will fail in the quench by cracking or warping irretrievably. Zach tries to avoid this by being as meticulous as possible, using his 15 years of experience to guide him. Looks like the blade came through the hardening process really well. It's straight, it doesn't have much warping. Um, little warps can be corrected, and I can see that the scale has blown away from the surface of the steel here, which tells me that the steel has contracted and become hard, and that's what I was looking for. So now this is ready for finished grinding and then a handle. The grinding operation is one of the areas where the skill is kind of most important and most obvious, and this is one of the things that really drives the cost. A single slip can, can ruin the piece in an instant. The handles are also an important factor for creating the perfect knife. Zach uses Arizona ironwood, which is a hard and durable material. Because of the hardness of the wood, it requires a lot more effort, skill and experience to shape. Zach designs the handles so that they serve the purpose of the knife. He makes the kitchen knife handles slim, but large enough for the chef to have a firm grip. A hunting knife, on the other hand, requires different properties. It might be used with cold or wet hands, which can cause them to slip. The final step in creating a Damascus knife is the etching, which makes the pattern bolder to the eye. Once dipped in the etchant mixture, one of the alloys oxidizes and turns darker, while the other alloy resists, maintaining its color. Now the Damascus pattern is revealed. But Zach isn't done yet. He needs to assess the quality of his creation. Let's test the edge. And I use paper for this. This is a simple test. It should glide through with no problem. This knife is razor sharp, with no dullness that needs adjusting. Zach has crafted another stunning Damascus knife. Next, we head to Saitama, Japan. Japanese sword making is a tradition that goes back centuries and one that's carried on to this day. Each sword requires dedication, skill and can take over 18 months to create. This is Master Akihara, an extremely skilled sword maker who's been crafting these blades for the last 21 years. In that time he went through a five-year apprenticeship and years of training to become one of only 180 swordsmiths working across Japan. Each sword is a unique artwork, and one that is made to be admired as you would a painting, as sheets of steel are meticulously folded into each other again and again. Wood grain-like patterns form, and these patterns, coupled with the immense skill of the swordmaster, create a completely unique blade. え、何を見るかというと、古い刀であれば、その刀が作られた時代がわかりますし、現代のものであれば、その作家がどういう時代のものを狙って作ったかなという作為がわかります。Knowing what to look for in each sword is important. Characteristics like the angle and length of the blade, or the way the metal is folded, could give away the era in which it was made, and even who made it. 切っ先の部分というのが、まあ、いろんな直線曲線が集まる場所でもあって、これはここはあの刀鍛冶の腕の見せ所でもあるし、その刀を通りや研ぎ師さんの腕の見せ所でもあります。だから僕らはこういうこ
Even for the most skilled, an intense amount of work goes into creating each blade over several months. The result is a work of art and cannot be produced without the level of dedication masters like Akihara put towards creating these sorts. ま、作品として常に最高のものを作らなくてはいけないという責任感と使命感のようなものがあります。それは一つには僕のプライドをかけて常にいいものを作らなくてはいけないという気持ちです。その中にはですね、僕の刀を持つ人に喜んでもらい
Yeah. And it's very important that these boxes, they have these gaps on them, so the liquid can, can leak from it. And also for oxygen to, to get in, because the meat, it needs to, needs to breathe. There are chemical changes that are happening. Yeah that are making the meat uh, untoxic. First, people didn't know this was a chemical process. It was an accident. Now this is a chemical process and we are, there are a lot of um, interesting things that we are, yeah, even still discovering. Yeah. Uh, it's also different after where the shark has been, in what depth, in what temperature he was caught. It's different after what, what chemicals are high or, or low in them. So in these boxes, the meat loses about around 30%. So it loses a lot of weight here. And then in the drying process, it loses like 50-70%. Uh, so total use of meat is around 8%. What happens to the ammonia when it drains? I mean, is it, is it okay to be stuck? I mean, you've got like, I've got boots on and you've got little <laughs> sandals with some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The ammonia is, the liquid here is, that's fine. We could drink it. I won't though. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's a you cure want for some. something. You want I, some, maybe? No. Uh, no. <laughs> One shark will give from 30 to 40 pieces of fillet. The meat ferments for six to nine weeks in the wooden boxes. Then it's hung outside for six months to fully dry out. Our next stop is New York, USA. This 200 pound mountain of dough will soon be hand rolled into a thousand bagels just a small fraction of the 100,000 bagels made at this shop every week. This is Daniel, a master bagel maker. He's been here for over a decade honing his skills, and it's extremely evident after seeing him at work. How long have you been making bagels? 18 years. 18 years. Daniel's been rolling 18 years. It takes understanding the temperature in the air. It takes understanding his machine that he works with, how long it should mix. All these things are such important factors about what happens with our bagel. Once the dough reaches the desired consistency, it's cut into sections and transferred over to the rolling table, where it's then formed into one large mound. We can make up to 15,000 bagels in a day, and this will make approximately 1,000 bagels. They cover the entire thing with a plastic sheet to help soften the dough before rolling. And it's only about a five minute process that allows that dough to connect a little better with each other. They're saying, hello, how are you? All those ingredients are basically doing that right now. At any given point, there are four expert rollers on hand. These skilled workers have at least 15 years of experience perfecting their craft, something Scott says is a dying breed. There's not a school of rolling bagels out there right now. And these people are experts at their field. Listen, I think Derek Jeter said it best. If you put 10,000 hours into something, you're a professional. And Daniel has definitely put 10,000 hours into it. It takes an hour to an hour and a half for those hand rollers to individually slice, roll, and twist about a thousand bagels. It takes a certain type of character because it's very tedious. You're cutting the same thing over and over. And I can tell who is rolling what bagel by the way they lock their bagel and form it together. Daniel has that little lip here that I noticed about Daniel's roll and then I can see, you know, those were Daniel's bagels. And it gives each bagel their own personality. Our bagels are like snowflakes. Everyone is individually different, and that's what makes it special. Our next stop is Paris, France. Mahmoud is master of bread. He even won an award for the best baguette in Paris. What he's going to show us is not your average baguette, but the baguette tradition which is a baguette made on site with simple ingredients. La baguette tradition est différente parce qu'elle a un procédé différent des autres pains en fait. C'est quelque chose qu'on peut pas faire vite. Si on on, on respecte pas le temps, eh ben on n'aura jamais une bonne tradition. Et c'est pour ça qu'elle est unique et c'est pour ça aussi qu'elle est connue. Making a baguette is much more complex and time consuming than you think. Every step requires inside knowledge, skill and expertise. It all starts with the dough. 
Mahmood starts making the dough at 5am, with only flour and water. He kneads it, then at 8am he adds yeast, salt and water again. L'eau c'est pour, euh, pour par exemple contrôler la température. Si par exemple ma pâte est trop froide, je vais rajouter de l'eau chaude. Si elle est trop chaude, je vais rajouter de l'eau froide. Ça me permet de récupérer en fait, euh, d'avoir à chaque fois la température la même tous les jours. Donc, donne un gant à hein, madame. Mais touchez, vous allez voir, elle est très froide. Mm -hmm. Oh ouais, c'est très très froid. Voilà, c'est pour ça que nous on va mettre de l'eau chaude ici. Parce que aujourd'hui, il fait très froid. Et, et nous, on pétrit dans la boulangerie, pas au sous-sol. La plupart des boulangers pétrissent au sous-sol. Donc, il fait souvent chaud au sous-sol. Mm -hmm. Mais nous, non, on est obligé de s'adapter parce que s'il fait froid, eh ben, ma pâte va être trop froide. S'il fait très chaud, ma pâte va être très chaude. Donc, je vais devoir à chaque fois réajuster. Okay. Je m'adapte en fonction de, de, du temps, en fait. The weather. Sa pâte, elle a reposé euh, pour euh, 3, 3 heures. heures c'est ça. Heures, Donc, heures. elle prend la température de, extérieure. De, de, parfait. Est-ce qu'il y a une température idéale ou... Oui, à la sortie, 24. Quand je sors ma pâte, mm -hmm. l'idéal c'est 24 degrés. Le plus important, c'est le mélange. Si on réussit le mélange, on réussit toute la production. Il faut que la pâte soit lisse. On ne pourrait jamais euh, ajouter tous les ingrédients comme ça, tout ensemble. Bah, c'est déconseillé, c'est comme la cuisine ou les gâteaux, on ne met jamais tout d'un coup. On surveille toujours le mélange et on réajuste, on réajuste à chaque fois. Parce que ce qui compte, c'est le résultat. Les gens, on entend les bulles qui commencent à... You can hear the sounds of the dough. Et vous m'avez juste dit que vous êtes en train d'ouvrir un autre boulangerie au Canada. Oui. Est-ce qu'il y a... Bon, bien sûr, il y a des différences de température. Euh, oui, ça va de, être nouveau pour moi. Ça sera une expérience pour moi. Je sais qu'il fait très très froid au Canada. Que, euh, par exemple, il y a des jours où, euh, où il fait moins 10, moins 20, peut-être. On n'a jamais ça à Paris. Donc ça va être nouveau pour moi. Il va falloir faire chauffer l'eau avec la casserole. <rire> Donc là, vous voyez, elle ne colle pas sur le bord. C'est arrondi. Vous pouvez toucher. C'est mou et à la fois ferme. Ok. Oh, oh c'est vrai. L'extérieur, c'est très ferme. Mais on a... Et en même temps, c'est comme une balle. Peut... Oui, voilà. oui. Vous pouvez taper, vous voyez, c'est dur et en même temps, c'est mou. Oui. C'est vraiment comme ça. Oui. Donc ça, ça veut dire que mon réseau, il est constitué et en même temps, c'est moelleux. Donc là, à la fin, je vais avoir une tradition avec une belle croûte parce qu'elle est dure et en même temps, ça sera moelleux à l'intérieur. Ça, c'est très, très bien. Donc nous, on va mettre un petit coup de deuxième pour lui donner un peu plus de force. Vous entendez Là, il y a des bulles d'air qui se forment et, euh, et elles vont éclater. Et c'est comme ça qu'on sait que la pâte, elle est prête. Donc là, vous avez vu, ça colle. Hein. Voilà. On va la laisser se reposer. Là, il y a une bulle d'air. C'est ce qu'on qu trouve dans les tradis après. Voilà, on va trouver. Et donc, ce qui fait la différence, c'est qu'il y a beaucoup de gens qui ont des bulles d'air, soit toutes petites. Mm -hmm. Moi, on va avoir toutes les tailles. Vous allez voir après, quand on ouvrira une, on aura des petites, des grosses, des moyennes, toutes les tailles. Est-ce qu'il y a un euh, message euh... Quand c'est petit, c'est euh, comme tout le monde. Quand c'est irrégulier, c'est personnel. C'est pour ça que la tradie, on la trouve. La mienne, on ne peut pas la trouver ailleurs. Vous ne pouvez pas contrôler la taille des de bulles d'air Je ne peux pas non. contrôler, mais je peux faire en sorte d'avoir des bulles irrégulières. Mm -hmm. Ça, c'est un de mes secrets, ça. When the dough is ready, it rests for one hour. Then it is taken out in small batches. Donc les gens font avec la farine. Nous, on fait avec l'eau. C'est plus propre. Et euh, c'est les anciennes méthodes. Pourquoi pas, pas de farine Parce qu'on va meilleur. modifier l'harmonie bah. des ingrédients. Si on fait avec la farine, on va baisser... Euh, le taux d'hydratation. Donc, c'est comme si on, mettra, on aura mis moins d'eau, mm -hmm. parce qu'on aura augmenté de la farine. Quand on farine, quand on sort avec la farine, tous ces, ces petits gestes, si à chaque fois on met de la farine, de la farine, de la farine, de la farine, eh ben on va perdre en, en hydratation et donc on aura moins de bulles. On va casser en fait le réseau à chaque fois. Donc, c'est pour ça qu'on fait avec de l'eau pour protéger le, le réseau au maximum. Regardez, vous avez vu les bulles et Elles sont déjà là. 
Okay. Et ce n'est mm -hmm. pas les mêmes tailles. Mm -hmm. Ça, c'est ce qu'on va retrouver dans le pain après. Et donc là, on retrouve, euh, comme tout à l'heure, c'est bombé et en même temps... Euh... The batches of dough will be left to rest until the following day, while batches from the day before are going to be cut in pieces and shaped. This is when the dough starts to resemble a baguette. On peut le faire à la main, mais ça prend beaucoup de temps. Okay. Et, euh, et quand on fait à la main, on chauffe la pâte. Ah oui, c'est vrai. Et euh, donc ça fait qu'on euh, devra faire, faire attention à la température, respecter que ce soit bien frais, parce que justement, on, on a chauffé la pâte. Et le problème de la main, c'est que ce ne sera pas droit. Ça sera, il y aura des coups plus gros, plus fins, plus gros, plus fins. Ça dépend en fait de la pression qu'on met pour la faire. C'est pour ça que la machine, ça permet d'être régulier. Ça, c'est du coton ou... C'est de oui. la toile. Ah, ok. Il y a des gens qui dessinent sur ça. Oh. Ah, ok, oui. Voilà. Bien sûr. oui. Et pourquoi utilisez-vous ça Parce que euh, ça ne colle pas. Et puis, euh, s'il y a de l'humidité dans l'air ou dans la machine, mm -hmm. et ben, ça va protéger la baguette. Le okay. tissu il va boire l'humidité. Et donc euh, la différence entre la baguette traditionnelle et la, ba la baguette, c'est qu'on utilise le... la pâte d'aujourd'hui Non, la non. baguette, euh, elle est faite le jour même, elle ne ah. se repose pas. La traduit, elle se repose. Voilà. Donc on met des rangées de 6. C'est l'idéal. Quand c'est trop serré, ça va mal cuire, elle va tomber, parce qu'il n'y aura pas assez de chaleur entre les traduits. Mm -hmm. Et puis, euh, quand c'est trop espacé, ça cuit trop vite à l'extérieur et pas assez à l'intérieur. Donc, c'est pour ça qu'il faut trouver le, le bon rendement, en fait. Vous utilisez ce, cet outil-là en, oui, en, en bois Oui. Parce qu'on pourrait, ne on pourrait jamais le faire avec les mains. Alors, en fait, la tradi, c'est l'un des pains les plus fragiles. Parce que euh, c'est pour ça que ça demande beaucoup de temps de repos. Euh, ça prend très, c'est très délicat, la tradition. Donc, pour protéger le, le réseau, les bulles d'air, en fait, au maximum, l'alvéolage, on est obligé de les prendre à la planche. Il faut être très délicat. Parce que comme ça, on respecte la, la ça. forme. Plus on fait attention à la tradie, mm -hmm. plus elle sortira bombée. Voilà. Maintenant, on va donner un coup de lame pour la dégazer mm -hmm. et puis pour l'esthétique aussi. Voilà. Soit on met un coup de lame, c'est ce que fait Mourad. Mm -hmm. Moi, j'aime bien mettre 4 ou 5. Est-ce qu'il y a une règle ou c'est juste un dessin Alors, il y a une règle. Il faut de préférence donner au milieu. Et puis ensuite, il euh, ne faut pas appuyer. Il faut avoir une lame qui coupe bien. C'est pour ça que j'ai plein de bobos partout. Et puis, plus on coupera bien, plus la grigne. C'est-à-dire que la... c'est ce qu'on verra à la fin, c'est ça la grigne. Ça, c'est la grigne. Mm -hmm. Ça coupe. Si on fait ça, mon gant, il va se trouer. One batch of dough will make about 20 baguettes, and about 200 baguettes will come out from the whole of the dough. La température est très importante aussi. 270. C'est important, oui. Si c'est pas assez chaud, ça sera plat. Si c'est trop chaud, ça va cramer trop vite. C'est pour ça que tout le monde pense que c'est facile de faire du pain. Mais faire du bon pain, voire du très bon pain ou de l'excellent pain, c'est très difficile. Ça a bien gonflé. Ça a hein. bien gonflé. C'est bon, vas-y, 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 sors, sors, sors. Voilà, c'est joli. Voilà. Ça fait juste 20 minutes. Non. Moins 19. Moins 19, ok. Voilà. voilà, là on a une, une belle green. It's very hot. <rire> Est-ce qu'on cherche un son particulier On sent que ça croustille bien, donc c'est que la croûte est bien épaisse. Et puis en même temps, on sent que c'est moelleux. C'est ça le pire. C'est que quand on touche, c'est moelleux, mais en même temps, ça fait un bruit de craquement. Elle a gardé sa forme. <rire> vrai. Elle n'est pas restée aplatie, mm -hmm. elle, elle a gardé sa forme. Voilà. Donc vous avez vu les bulles, c'est pas la même taille. Donc on a toutes les tailles. Petite, grande, moyenne. Mm -hmm. La mie teint vers le jaune. Ça c'est dû à la fermentation. Mm -hmm. 
et puis euh, donc c'est on a une croûte qui est assez épaisse assez dure et à l'intérieur c'est très moelleux très tendre et là on sent bien le froment le blé français vous les sentir oui <rire> wow. vous pouvez so toucher nice. hein, vous allez voir c'est très moelleux ah oui c'est vrai so soft inside voilà wow. et, et là mm -hmm. c'est très dur ouais. voilà <rire> il y a aussi quelque chose qu'on peut faire ça quand, quand on voit ça c'est que c'est très aéré à l'intérieur mm -hmm. on arrive à voir à travers et donc il y a de l'espace pour la lumière de voilà. passer. Ah. Quand on a ça, c'est qu'on a un réseau de bulles à l'intérieur. Wow. Quand on voit la lumière. Incroyable. Il faut qu'il fasse un petit peu plus sombre parce qu'il y a beaucoup de lumière ici. Si j'étais la lumière. Oh. Vous avez vu mm -hmm. C'est beau, hein <rire> C'est pour ça que la tradie, elle est bonne à manger, même pour la digestion. Elle est facile à digérer. Mm -hmm. Contrairement aux autres pains, on a beaucoup de mie et donc on se sent lourd. Alors que la tradie, non. Vous voyez, il n'y a rien. Il n'y a rien dedans. Parce que la, la baguette, c'est très grand, mais en fait, oui. c'est plein d'air. Il y a plein d'air dedans, euh. voilà. Quand c'est bien fait, hein. mm -hmm. quand c'est pas très bien fait, on a beaucoup de, de, de mie dedans. Mm -hmm. Et on ne re, retrouve pas après, là, ce qu'on va voir, les bulles. Euh... Voilà. Wow. Ça, on ne le retrouve pas si la lumière ne passe pas. On aura des mie mm -hmm. et c'est pas bon pour la digestion. Et ça serait blanche Oui. Ah. Vous avez vu les... Les belles mmh. yes, C'est vrai, ce sont tous, tous les réguliers. C'est ça. Mmh. Ça, c'est ma signature. Vous voulez goûter Il est temps, hein voilà. ah, Merci. Pour vous aussi. Merci. <rire> Donc là, on sent bien le blé. Mmh. Et quand on touche, mmh. c'est humide. On okay. dirait que c'est mouillé. Ah, ah ok. C'est vrai, en ouais, fait. Ouais. Uh -huh. On dirait que c'est mouillé. Mmh. Ça, c'est euh, l'air qui, euh, qui est qui C'est euh, euh... l'eau aussi que je mets dans le mm -hmm. pain. Donc, la, le taux d'hydratation que j'avais dit tout à l'heure, okay. si on, on réussit à le préserver, mm -hmm. et ben, ça fait qu'on a une mie qui est humide. Donc, c'est croquant, mm -hmm. à la fois moelleux, et ça fond dans la bouche, en fait. Il mm n'y -hmm. a pas de mie euh, agressive, non, non. C'est très léger. léger. Mm. Mahmoud has been a baker for 28 years, but even before that, he was learning about baking from his father by watching him ever since he was a child. It was there Mahmoud gained the passion for baking. He then went to study, where he gained a diploma in sciences and eventually earned a chemistry degree, all while working with his father. Est-ce qu'il faut, euh, faut vraiment une connaissance de la chimie ou... Ça m'a aidé. En fait, la chimie, la prépa, toutes mes études m'ont permis de, de mieux comprendre ce que je fais en fait. Parce que je sais qu'il y a des réactions qui se passent et des choses qui sont importantes. Des détails, les pesées, les dosages, les mélanges, tout ça, c'est des choses qui font partie de la chimie que nous, on nous a enseignées, qui ont une importance énorme. Alors que je pense que certains boulangers n'ont pas cette notion d'importance pour ce genre de détails. J'ai des amis qui me disent, euh, je suis le boulanger euh, chimiste. Ils m'ont donné un surnom. Our last stop is Brittany, France. In Brittany, we met with Jean-Yves Bordier, son and grandson of butter and cheese makers, who brought back to France the 19th century technique of malaxage, using this big wooden wheel to knead the butter. To Jean-Yves, the malaxage is a more romantic way to wake mutton. Je suis toujours parti du principe que ce qui était le plus important, c'était les émotions. Après, on va essayer de voir comment on peut faire avec les émotions. Mais si on fait un produit que marketing, ça ne m'intéresse pas. Comme ça ne m'intéresse pas de produire 10 millions de tonnes de beurre, ce n'est pas mon métier. Moi, je suis un tout petit bonhomme et je fais des toutes petites choses, c'est tout. C'est très dur ce qu'il fait là. C'est très dur ce qu'il fait, Eric, là. C'est le moment le plus dur, c'est... Et là, il obtient un beurre remarquable et franchement, il n'était pas facile. Là, tu vas juste le rouler comme ça. Essayer de l'enrouler comme ça. Mm -hmm. On va le laisser tourner et après, tu vas le reprendre. C'est comme ça, nowhere we'll do this. Vas-y. Comme ça Tu le roules, ouais. Comme ça. Oh, wow, c'est so heavy. D'accord. <rire> 
sorry. Les gants, ils sont trop grands. Je vais juste aller de ce côté, peut-être. Oh, man, c'est super fort. Ouais, ouais. Ouf. Ouais. 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 Tu ramènes les gants. Tu vas mettre ton cul. Ok. Euh, tu le fais une fois et après, juste en haut. Tu laisses ton doigt comme ça. Ah, ok. Ça, ça va, c'est plus petit. C'est plus petit. Ici. Ici. Et quand tu vois him doing that, it's ça, um, It almost has like an harmony. It's not easy. Monsieur Bode said this is 50 kilos of butter. So try and lift a bit of it. It's gonna be like what, 10 kilos in just in one go. Il faut combien de temps pour apprendre à Alors, ramasser le, pour, le pour apprendre comme ça? ce métier? Trois ans. Trois ans. Oui. Vous savez pourquoi? Non. Pourquoi? Parce que le soleil et la pluie ne tombent pas de la même manière tous les ans. Et c'est le soleil et la pluie qui vont donner à l'herbe et à la terre un goût particulier que les vaches doivent aimer et que les saisons vont mettre en musique. Le printemps, l'été, l'automne, l'hiver. Et que pour apprendre à découvrir le beurre, qui n'est que le résultat de la nourriture des animaux, il faut trois ans. Eric then salts the butter using fine salt. This step is crucial to make sure the butter finally rejects all the leftover water it has in it. On est en train de voir, vous voyez quelque chose, la vis est en train de se tremper, l'eau est en train de couler, le sel est en train d'attaquer la molécule de matière grasse et la molécule de matière grasse euh, prend le sel comme une agression et rejette l'eau qu'elle a en elle. Et l'eau s'en va. On va avoir perdu presque un litre d'eau. Okay. Mais, et je finis en perdant l'humidité, je concentre la matière sèche Dans la matière sèche, il y a le gras, et dans le gras, il y a le goût. Oh wow! So actually, I can see that it's getting wetter and wetter. It's picking up more water. Vous entendez le bruit? Quand mon beurre chante, c'est qu'il pleure. Quand mon beurre pleure, c'est qu'il chante. Although they work with old techniques, they're not trying to recreate an old recipe. Traditions here are valued, and the dedication and skill of the workers here uphold the same quality of butter, regardless of how much time has passed. On travaille avec des méthodes d'hier, mais on utilise un lait vivant d'aujourd'hui. Donc le beurre que je fabrique, le but de mon beurre n'est pas d'aller retrouver le beurre de 1857. Ce que fait Eric, c'est véritablement quelque chose qui n'existe plus. Ce que vous voyez là, c'est des gestes du 19e avec un lait de 2020, Et, et c'est comment restituer et perpétuer la qualité de nos anciens, mais en vivant dans le monde d'aujourd'hui.